So, thank you for coming. In this uh, afternoon session, it is again my great pleasure to introduce you yet another distinguished speakers, Professor Padre Krishna, who has kindly agreed to visit us and to give a series of lectures at these schools. Professor Badri Krishna uh, graduated uh, from Indian Institute of Technology, Campus, and he received his PhD from the Department of, of Physics, Pennsylvania State University, working with famous relativists, Abha Ashkenter. Later on, uh, the world line of Professor Kadri and Krishna passed through many places. It is indeed difficult to, to mention all of them, but I can say that Einstein Institute for Gravitational Physics, Max Planck Institute for Physics, and uh, Hanover Davis University, and some other places. Professor Krishna has a broad uh, interest in modern science, modern gravitational science, especially in searches for periodic gravitational wave signals, mathematical theory of black holes, application of black hole theory in numerical relativity, gravitational wave data analysis, and numerical relativity. Professor Badri Krishnan has a number of awards. Amongst them, Bruno Rossi Prize of American Astronomical Society, shared with wider scientific collaboration, Group Achievement Award of the Royal Astronomical Society, shared with wider scientific collaboration, Breakthrough, Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, again shared with the wider collaboration, Group Cosmology Prize, shared with wider scientific collaboration, and etc. Please join me uh, to welcome warmly Professor Badri Krishna for coming to us. Thank you, Professor Alia, for the very kind introduction. <laughs> um, so, and it's a real pleasure to be here. So in the first lectures, I will talk about gravitational waves from black holes and neutron stars. And Scott has very kindly laid all the groundwork that I need for these two talks here. So the first two lectures are going to be, the first lecture is going to be binary black holes. So I'll introduce the first detection and a few words about um, binary black holes and what we can learn from them. And the second one's going to be uh, introduction to what are called continuous gravitational waves. So these are waves from neutron stars, which have a slight deformation and that are spinning rapidly. And the next lectures tomorrow will be more into the signal processing and the statistics for doing these searches. OK, so let's get started. So for me, as for many people in this field, so the first motivation I had when I first got into the field was this really beautiful observation of the hull taylor binary system. And again, Scott has very kindly written all the equations before me, so I don't really need to do that much introduction here. So if you have a binary system, again, think of two-point particles, uh, you know, not very close to each other, and the speed's much less than speed of light. So in that case, the uh, orbital period changes according to this equation here. So P is the orbital period. You have G and C, and you have, again, P upon 2 pi here. And the important combination is of masses, m1, m2, divided by the total mass to the power of 1 third and a function of the eccentricity, and that is, again, an equation that Scott had in one of his slides. And so this, de uh, this determines the uh, rate of change of orbital period as uh, the system loses energy due to gravitational radiation. And this is valid for V upon C much smaller than 1. And this, there are these beautiful observations of radio uh, waves from these uh, systems. So this particular pulsar, 1913 plus 16, and now there are uh, a few others, but this is, the, this is the historically an important one. So it's a binary system in which I have two neutron stars orbiting each other. Uh, one of these is seen as a pulsar, which means that we can very precisely measure its uh, uh, motion in, in its orbit over a long uh, uh, duration. 
And this system is, these are the parameters. So it's about six kiloparsecs away. It is an eccentric orbit, quite eccentric in fact. Its period is one third of a day. Uh, the masses are like typical neutron stars. And if you put in the equations here, you have all the parameters, the masses, you have the eccentricity, everything from the radio observations, and you can measure uh, p dot, that's the only number that you can measure with this equation, then you get this particular number here. So 2.4 times 10 to the minus 12. Okay? And based on this number, you can make then the following graph, which is again a very famous one. Uh, this is from 2004, and they have, I think, an updated one since then. These observations spanned the mid-70s and right up to 2005, so a very long period. And over this period, you can do the following. Assume that there was no emission of gravitational waves. I just have a Keplerian motion. Then you know that if uh, I measure this neutron star at a particular point in its orbit, it'll come back there exactly after one period. Okay? And that will continue. With, now you can predict when the next one will be, and so you can just, uh, you know, so that, that is a zero line here. If it emits gravitational waves, it loses energy in gravitational radiation, so it shrinks and it moves faster in this case. The, so then when the neutron stars come back to that point in the orbit, it comes a little bit earlier than you expect. Okay? And this tells you how much earlier it came. That's the y-axis of this plot. Okay? So just based on this value of p dot, you can measure this parabola here. So the solid line is what you get by this observation of uh, the uh, speed dot. And these dots are the actual observations. Okay, So just based on the masses, you can predict what the solid line is. And these dots are the prediction. Okay. Now, to me, this is a beautiful confirmation of Einstein's theory. Of course, one might say this is just working within Einstein's theory. You're not setting up an alternative and you know, testing Einstein's in that way. But still, and this, I defy you to come with an alternate theory which would give you this accurate of a prediction and is not Einstein's theory of relativity. Okay? So what we want to do now is to do something very similar. So in this previous case, the agreement is excellent, so it's within a fraction of a percent. But this is still not relativistic from our perspective. So in this case, if you look at the velocities, it's only like 0.15% of speed of light. It's tiny compared to what we want to do. And for our case, if you have binary black holes and neutron stars, we want to go much beyond this. We want to go to V over C of close to 0.1 or higher than that. Okay? So much deeper relativistic region in which things are much, effects of GR should be much more important. Okay? So, and this is where the LIGO comes in. So LIGO has been taking data for a long time. You, many people are not aware of this entirely, and they, of course, everyone knows the recent results. But LIGO has been in this business since 2002. So we had this first set of runs, which were called the science runs, S1 to S6, so six science runs there. And these covered a period from 2002 to 2010. And this included also observations of uh, uh, the initial LIGO detectors, the Virgo detectors, and also the geo detector in Germany, the Tama detector in Japan. These were smaller and much less sensitive, and this was the, these were the most sensitive ones. But still, there was this huge uh, effort put into the experimental and the observational work for eight years with the initial LIGO detectors. And over this time, there was no detection that was made. Um, but still, a lot of things were learned. One learned how to operate these instruments, and one learned how to analyze the data from these instruments. And after a period of upgrades, so 2010, 2015, the advanced LIGO uh, detector was operational, so in 2015. Uh, there was the first science run that's called O1 from September to January in 2015 and 16. This was LIGO only. And then after a short break in November of 2016 was the second science run, went on till August. And this one was LIGO, but partly with Virgo as well in joint observation for the last uh, few weeks of that science run. And presently, we have the third science run which is ongoing. So that is LIGO and Virgo. That is started from spring of this year and is ongoing. And um, as Scott talked about, there's future upgrades expected uh, to these. So we have 
upgrades to LIGO and Virgo, and we expect to have more sensitive instruments followed in, in the next years, followed by further upgrades in future instruments. And then we have the Japanese cargo detector that's under commissioning and even taking data very soon, I believe. And we have a detector which is very similar to the LIGO detectors in India, and it's been funded, and the site has been selected, and its construction should begin any time. I think this year is my guess. So the point is that uh, there's a huge history of gravitational wave searches and data analysis and observational results. And now is the time when we have detections, and we have a lot of data that's available. And in the future, we'll have a whole network of these instruments all over the world. So you can expect to have an order of magnitude increase in the amount of data that we have and the number of detec detections that we make. So this is the first thing. So you can yourself download LIGO data. So if you want to look at LIGO data, you do not need to join the LIGO collaboration. So you might wonder, well, we have this uh, collaboration with 1,000 people. Do I really want to join? What can I do there? Uh, you know, might have all kinds of questions, but you don't have to do that. You can just go to this web page. It's called gwopenscience.org. Um, so what they do is when you have uh, specific events, they release data around these events. And they also release, after a time lag, full bulk data for the different science rooms that I mentioned. Yeah. There's an app you can get for your phone that lets you know when an event comes in. Yes, indeed. It plays a chart. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It won't get the data with that app, which is what I care about. And the point is that the more people that look at the data, the more pressure there is on LIGO to release the data. Okay? So please, please, please go there. And it's, it's very helpful, and you can get the data yourself. And today in this lecture, I'll talk very simple analysis that you can do. Very, very complicated analysis, in fact. Uh, um, and now you can say, well, we have the data. How do I analyze? Do I need to write my own code to do this? Well, we also have open source software, which can do all of this analysis. This is the one that I've been involved in, so I think it's particularly nice. It's called PyCBC. So it's meant for things like compact binary coalescences, uh, but, and this is binary black holes and, and neutron stars and so on. So we have software available. We have data available. If you have an idea for how to do this analysis, you want to modify the waveform, you can do it yourself. Okay. So if at the end of this talk, I don't plan to sort of give you a comprehensive overview of the, all the analysis that is done. But if, as a result of this talk, you go to the LIGO website, the Open Science website, and you go to PyCBC or any other software, and look at the data yourself, then mission accomplished for me. OK? Right, so this is what I was saying. So anyone in the world, not just LIGO or LIGO members, can try to discover events or properties of existing events. So if you have an idea for, you know, you believe your own binary black hole theory, you can try that out. OK? Of course, you have to compete with all the other people doing similar analysis, but OK, that's up to you, right? So <laughs> if you're smart enough, then you can do it. So thus far, uh, I think it's fair to say that of, of from the bulk data releases and for the first two science runs, there's essentially three groups which have analyzed the data and reported uh, events. The first, of course, is the LIGO-Virgo collaboration itself. So they have first access to the data, so they get the first cut at it. Um, so they have uh, analyzed, they have presented their list of events for 01 and 02. And they also make, as Scott said, real-time announcement of events. And you can download an app. You can get sort of these events uh, on, your, on your cell phone. And if you have your own telescope, you can point to where the, say, the event is. Then you can try to find the counterpart in electromagnetic observations. Uh, then there's uh, my group, so that's in Hanover. So we have, since 2018, we're not members of the collaboration, so we analyze the data independently. So far, we have completed the O1 analysis, and the O2 is upcoming. There's also a group at Princeton, so they have presented their list of events from O1 and O2. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is sort of the first, uh, this is sort of the main things that you hear about, so binary black holes and neutron stars, so this in spiral merger ring down that Scott talked about. Apart from these, which I will not talk about too much here, are what are called the unmodeled burst searches. So these are searches which say I have a short burst of energy for a short time, but I don't assume any particular model for this uh, duration. 
So this could be, for example, a supernova core collapse event, or could be some strange event which we have no model for. So this is the kind of analysis that would uh, pick this up. Okay? And again, I won't have time to go into the details here, but there's this analysis applied to the binary black holes can also report interesting sort of features of these events. There's also other very active ongoing efforts, which again, if you're not in this business, you may not hear too much about it, but I will talk about uh, the, this, this aspect here. So these are the searches for these very long duration signals. So all the binary black holes, these are very, very short events. But we also have the possibility of much longer events from spinning neutron stars. And we also have the possibility of the stochastic background from the Big Bang, which is unlikely, but from astrophysical populations of binary black holes and neutron stars. So in these cases, we have imaginary population of these uh, systems that are merging. So we can't observe them independently, but we can observe the population of these events, so in a stochastic kind of way. So that, I won't talk about that in these, in, in these lectures, but again, that's also a very active field of research. OK, so let's now go. Again, please interrupt me anytime you want for questions, and uh, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. So the first detection was in September 14 of uh, 2015. And again, it's interesting that this was not the official start of the science run. The science run should have started sort of a uh, day or two uh, after this. And there were a number of analysis pipelines which were looking at the data in real time already in September 14, even before that, in fact. And these were of these kind here. The, the first ones were of these, uh, the burst searches, which do not assume a particular model. They just assume a burst of uh, uh, um, energy, and they want to sort of find this excess energy for, for, for a short time. So these ones reported an event. And the people to do this were, in fact, right in Hanover, uh, uh, run, running the searches. And, and we had this event in uh, uh, September 14th. And um, it was clear very soon after that that this might be an interesting event. Uh, the biggest fear at the time, I remember, was uh, could this have been an injection that was done? So often what happens in LIGO is that to test all the, uh, uh, some of the hardware and all the analysis pipeline, you want to add the signal to the data in the hardware, in fact. So that's called a hardware injection. That is simply test all the analysis uh, and, and so on. So our biggest fear was this is not a fear, but this is the biggest, uh, our, our suspicion was that somebody was doing these tests and this is what we were seeing in the data. But it became very clear that in fact this was, could not be injection because we, we did not have the capability even to do the injection at the time. So in fact, very soon after that, this was reported to the collaboration and then confirmed that this was a binary black hole system and the results were published in, in February of the following year, and the rest, as I say, is history. So this is what was seen. Uh, so I will talk about this in quite a bit of detail in the, uh, the next 15, 20 minutes. So this is the Hanford detector, that is the uh, Livingston detector. And um, so to get this, uh, a plot from the actual data, some minimal analysis has been done, nothing very complicated. Uh, so what has been done is that the data has been bandpassed to be between 50 and 350 hertz. So in other words, the big noise sources are outside this frequency band, you take it out, you just look at the frequency range within this band here. There's some strong spectral lines in this data which have been removed, and the signal in Hanford arrives a little bit later uh, than in Livingston. We have two instruments at the other opposite ends of the United States. So detect uh, the signal reaches one instrument first and then the other one a little bit later. So you shift them in time so that you line them up. And the orientation of these two detectors is opposite to each other. So you've got to flip the sign in one instrument. So what is done here is, um, is exactly that. So, so this is Hanford and Livingston combined with this operation of this time shift and the flip. So then you see that the signal, this one here, aligns pretty well in the two instruments. Okay. So then it's clear that there is a possibility of an event in the, in the, in, in the data. So of course then you have to do further analysis to see what was this event and could this have been caused by some noise in the detector itself. So that was what several months after that were spent, we spent doing. And this is, in fact, a very useful presentation of the signal itself. This is exactly what Scott talked about, about the our chirping signal. So what you see in time is, first of all, note the time. It's a very, very, it's a sub, it's a fraction of a second here. 
over this time, the frequency of the signal increases very rapidly, and it's very, very loud at the end. Okay? So it's what is called a chirp signal that is increasing in frequency, increasing in amplitude, exactly the way that you heard about in the previous lectures. Okay? So now you can ask yourself, well, why, and by the way, so this is a reconstruction of this same event with a numerical relativity simulation, which was simulating two black holes orbiting each other. And again, the fit with these choices that were made was still quite good. But I won't talk so much about that. I'll talk about, in fact, this plot here. Okay. And this is something that I want to get to, hopefully, by tomorrow. So this is the plot which convinced us that the event was actually significant. So particle physics told us that we need a five sigma event to have to claim something extraordinary. So we said, OK, we'll give you a five sigma <laughs> calculation. <laughs> And certain choices were made which ensured that we would get to five sigma. So in this plot, I'll explain this in much more detail tomorrow. This is the background of events. That is the first binary black hole detection. And that is, this, uh, that, is much more than, uh, that is more than five sigma. But I'll talk about this later. Okay. So before I go into the details of this, uh, this plot here, so just give an update on the things that happened since then. So the LIGO-Virgo analysis has so far published 10 BBH mergers and one neutron star boundary merger. And so these are the 10 events. So the label is always GW. 15 stands for the year, the month, and the day. So 15 -09 -14, 15 10 12 that's in October. That's just after Christmas. And these ones are from 02. So these three are from the first science run, and these seven are from the second science run. And again, if you've been following all the releases, uh, all the candidate events like Scott has with, with, with the app, then there's more events that are released for O3, but still no published ones yet. <clears throat> and of course, the big revolution after that was the neutron star merger event that was 170817, and that happens also in O2. So we have then 10 plus one event so far reported, yes. Are these also greater than five sigma? No, 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 not all of these are five sigma, no. Yeah, so I, I'll talk a bit more about that later. So the five sigma was for the first detection, right? So then we are really sure. I mean, it's not that we need five sigma to be convinced of a detection. This is really to convince others, let's say, OK? <laughs> or to convince everyone that they can be, we want to leave no possible doubt that this is a real event, right? So then you want to really make sure that the first one is a five sigma event. And it didn't have to be. It was a pure you know, accident that this happened this way. Because you know, to get this plot here, I, this is all that was done. So you didn't need to have these hundreds of people working for a decade with millions of dollars being spent on computing to get this plot here, right? It's a good way to start. It's a good way to start, but this is not what we were expecting. What we were expecting was a much weaker signal, and that is why you need to do more analysis, right? I mean, if we had gone and uh, told our funding agencies, well, look, we, the first event is going to be so loud, we just need one laptop to do the analysis, then they would have laughed at us, right? But it just so happened this was so loud, and that's why you could do the five sigma calculation for this. But this did not have to be the case. So for the others, are not so loud. So for the others, in fact, we do not reach five sigma. Yeah. No, no, no. It's 40 megaparsecs away. So not in our galaxy now. 40 megaparsecs. Yeah. So no, not in a galaxy, no, no. So all of these are, are, are really megaparsec, gigaparsec scale, so not, not, not in our galaxy. OK. So these are the 10 events reported by the LIGO Virgo collaboration and the BNS merger. And just as a historical note, this event here, 15, 10, 12, if you look at the initial papers that were published after the first uh, uh, event, this was not classified as a bona fide event. This was called a LIGO-Virgo trigger, LVT, 15, 10, 12. So that meant this is an interesting candidate, but we do not claim that this is a proper detection candidate. Okay? So we were not sure at the time. So if you ask sort of people in the collaboration, they would have said most would have believed that this is a real uh, event. And in fact, when we reanalyzed O1 data, so we then did a better analysis, and then we claimed 
that 15, 10, 12 was in fact a real event, then and and we and, and we and we showed that in, in this in this publication here, and after that LIGO also agreed with us. So then this has been promoted now to a real bona fide gravitational wave event. Yeah. How, how could these simulations fit so much with the real data? I mean, if it was a little bit out of line, it would still be okay, but it is just follows the same. How could that? This is a remarkable thing. So. Uh, I will talk about the modeling a little bit uh, tomorrow, not, not today. So as, uh, again, you heard today morning, right? The, the first part of the analysis is just the post newton calculation of this inspired link point particle. And then you have the numerical simulations for the merger. You combine them to get a model for the full inspiral merger and the ring down. And that is the thing that fits very nicely with these events. So I will make one comment on that, which is that we were a bit lucky with these events, which is, in other words, the models we have now are not very precise. So if you want to do really high precision measurements of the chirp mass within you know, fraction of a percent, and you want to test very, very small deviations from Einstein's theory, so that we cannot do at the moment. So that means that if the first detections had been much louder, so that you need to measure them more precisely, then the existing models would not have given the right answer. And in fact, if, for example, if LISA were to fly today, so LISA is going to measure these <coughs> binary black hole mergers with much higher SNRs. And for, for, for those kinds of events, you, the existing models will probably not work. What can I say? Yes. Uh, I mean, you say that this is too good to be true. I mean, this BNS was even more too good to be true, let alone the modeling uh, issues there. Right? Um, just to give an idea of this, right? we had to localize in the sky. And I had made a bet with people that Virgo would not see any event in O2, which was true. But this event happened to be exactly the blind spot of Virgo, which allowed us to localize this thing better in the sky. So many, many things had to go amazingly right <laughs> for, uh, even for this event. And in fact, if you ask someone a BNS event at 40 megaparsec, they'd say, the first one, you're crazy. And this cannot be. So nature is very kind to us. And also, if you look at these events here, right? Uh, look at the, we have 10 events. We have 12 months in a year. You might expect one in January, one in February, one in March. But look, it's mostly in August and September. The universe produces black hole merge in August and September. <laughs> of course, that's a statistical thing. Once you have many more events, then. It should be a much more uniform distribution, but I mean, as of now. To be fair, haven't there, there was an analysis that looked into the distribution, and it's, it's not that big. It, it is, yes. I, I'm just saying that <laughs> you know, if, if you didn't do any analysis, just look at this list here, right? Look, eight, 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 eight. No, come on. <laughs> so many strange things will happen in this business here. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, on that, there have been three candidates released in the past week. Uh, so in fact, we're coming to August now, OK? <laughs> <laughs> so you can expect interesting. Uh, <laughs> there were practically none in June, right? So yeah, in, uh, June, well, OK, there's one in June, 1706 <laughs> or eight years. But nothing in March or April. No, those are bad months for binary black holes. Um, and also, the masses of these are typically tens of solar masses. The lightest one is, is, is this one here. And the distances are, you know, hundreds of megaparsecs or a gigaparsec away. Okay, anyway, so let's go on. And then there was the results from the Princeton group that is much more recent, earlier this year. So they found a new event back in 01, which was 15, 12, 16. So that's 10 days before the third event there. And they also claimed three new binary black hole events with high significance in, in 02. So, um, and they claim three of the more marginal events. So these are three and uh, these are four events in addition to the ones that have been released so far. So this we will see in the, in, in the next weeks or so if this is true or not. And again, this is something for you to get involved in. So somebody has made a claim that there are actually interesting events in LIGO. You can get the data yourself. You can get the software yourself. You can write your own code to do it if you want. And you do not have to join this big 1,000 plus member collaboration to do so. Okay. All right, so let's go back to the first BBH merger. 
So the basic question is, what we saw was this thing here. Okay. Why is this a binary black hole merger? Assume you didn't know anything else. This is all that you saw. So then you might, and then you look at this particular plot, here's the frequencies increasing. What could this be, right? Could it be a collapsing star? Well, maybe it is, right? I mean, as a star shrinks, its angular momentum is conserved, it spins up faster. So maybe you can get that to work, okay? But the obvious candidate is a binary in spiral that we all know from other calculations. So let's take as a working hypothesis that this is a binary black hole or a binary system that is merging, okay? We don't know yet if this is a black hole or not. Maybe these are two stars that are merging. Maybe these are two white dwarfs that are merging, two neutron stars that are merging. How could we say that these are two black holes, in fact? So I will now present analysis which is very, very complicated. It's so complicated that you need very expensive piece of paper and a pencil and a ruler to do the analysis, okay? But with that, you can convince yourself this actually is a binary black hole system. Uh, so we'll go back to this equation that Scott very helpfully derived, which is the frequency rate at which it changes, which depends on the chirp mass m1, m2 to this power, divided by total mass to that power. And you can integrate this equation. So you get f to the minus 8 thirds is proportional to the time. So in this equation, this Tc is an integration constant. And um, yeah, so when T is equal to T, it has to be before Tc. When T reaches Tc, then this formally diverges to infinity. So of course, at that point, you cannot trust this calculation. But before that, this should be a reliable measure of the frequency. Okay. So now just to recall, again, Scott covered this in the morning. So the way you get this is from the energy flux. So for a binary system, you get the energy flux, that is the rate of energy is leaving the system in gravitational waves. This affects the binding energy, so that's the binding energy here. And then you energy balance, and then you get an equation for the rate of change of the, of the frequency. So omega here is the orbital frequency, and the F here was the gravitational wave frequency. Okay. So now here's what you can do. So you have this particular plot here. Okay, go to the LIGO web page, print that thing in a big piece of paper. You can make it a print on a graph paper if you want. Okay, and then you do the following. So you take a ruler, draw an axis of time right across here, and you measure the time between two successive zero crossings, let's say. Uh, measure the time between two of these successive peaks or the two of these successive troughs here. Okay? So I had students do this and you get the right answer, in fact, okay? So literally, look at the millimeter scale in the time units, measure the time difference between these things here, and do this as far back as you can. So measure, uh, so we did it for a zero crossing, so draw the line, and you see the time difference between successive zero crossings of this data. Okay, I mean somewhere here is probably hard to do, but you know, after here this becomes quite reliable. Okay, do this for both the Livingston and the Hanford data, so we get these sets of zero crossings. The difference between the successive zero crossings gives you a measure of the time it takes for half a cycle. So that's a measure for the frequency at that time, for the signal. Okay. So by doing this, you get a measure for the frequency here, frequency here, and frequency as a function of time. Do it for both the Hanford and Livingston data. You've got to stop somewhere here, because then you reach the peak after that. Of course, the model is not reliable. But get as far as you can here, and then you get frequency as a function of time. Then take a calculator that you have on your phone. Compute f to the minus 8 thirds. This is what we got from this calculation that we talked about earlier. And that must depend linearly on the time. Okay? 
And then you plot f to the minus 8 thirds. OK, you've got to subtract some fiducial frequency uh, with, with some scale here, not subtract. And then you get a straight line and try to fit a straight line to these data points. And you measure the slope of this line. Again, take a ruler, measure the x-axis, the y-axis, divide, and you get a slope. And convert the slope with this equation that we have here, with these coefficients, and estimate thereby the chirp mass of the system. OK? Any questions on that? As I said, very complicated. You need a big grant and a big computing facility to do this calculation, but good. And if you do this, then you can see how much do you have to vary the chirp mass to fit the data, and you can find a best fit. So the best fit is the blue one, um, that is the one here, that is about 30 solar masses, and the, and the red one is uh, about, no, sorry, green is the best fit. The red one is for 40 solar masses, and the blue one is for 30 solar masses. So in, in, in the end, you find from this calculation the chirp mass has to be between 30 and 40 solar masses. OK? So what does this imply for the system now? So let's now go back to the model we had of the binary merger. OK? So assume for simplicity that both the masses are the same. We'll simplify this later, but just for the moment, assume m1m is equal to m2. Then from the chirp mass, you can get the total mass, which is just this constant here times the chirp mass. And the total mass, therefore, is about 70 solar masses. All right? And then you say, well, go back to this plot that we had here. How close to the two, how fast is orbital frequency? This, is, this remember, is twice the orbital frequency. Okay? So again, to see that, just keep in mind equal masses. If I just switch them half an orbit, you get the same system back. So the frequency of gravitational waves is twice the frequency of the orbit. Okay? So at a frequency of 150 hertz, the orbital frequency is 75 hertz. Okay? Right, so let's go here. So I have 75 hertz. If I'm orbital frequency 75 hertz, apply Kepler's third law and find the separation between the two objects. And with the total mass that's given from here, so then you get 350 kilometers. So the closest that these two objects come to each other is 350 kilometers. And then they merge, of course. But in that model, the closest they come roughly is 350 kilometers. So now, remember, these two objects have to fit in this orbit. So in other words, if I have an orbit like this here, that's 350 kilometers across, or that's the radius, so it's twice of that. So I have two stars. So they cannot touch. If they were to touch, they wouldn't orbit in this way that we described. So they have to be compact enough that they have to fit within this orbit. So we need to have an object which has a mass of half of that, 35 solar masses, which is small enough to fit within this orbit. And if you look at the Schwarzschild radius of 350, of, of a, a black hole of uh, 35 solar masses, you'll get 103 kilometers. Yeah. Indeed, it does change, yes. So, yeah, so this is not going to replace, I will talk about that in a minute. So, of course, the actual analysis done in the LIGO publication was not this one here. So it was a much more sophisticated analysis, which included all the effects that you, that you have in mind. And that gives you the right answer, of course. So this is not going to give you the right answer. It's going to give you sort of a heuristic picture of what the system is. 
So if you want sort of a first back of the envelope calculation, then this is what you might do. This is not meant to replace the full analysis, of course. So just to say, just based on very simple argument, just from the data that we have, can we say these are two black holes? That is the only purpose. So of course, you have effects of spins and eccentricity and so on. All of those will modify the, the result, and you get much more accurate results. But this is not meant to be that. Okay. So anyway, so if these were two Schwarzschild black holes, and of course, R1 plus R2 would be 206 kilometers, and that would fit within 350 kilometers. And there's no plausible neutron star model which can be which can lead to masses of 35 solar masses or 70 solar masses. So the only alternative that we have right now from known physics are two black holes. Okay. So now you might say, well, what happens if we included mass ratios? Well, that's easy, in fact. So now you can say, well, let's assume that the mass ratio is not exactly 1. So let's call Q to be the mass ratio, M1 upon M2. And let's take the convention that M1 is bigger than M2. Okay. So we have a new parameter, which is a mass ratio, which is bigger than 1. Still, the thing that we measure from the data is a chirp mass. And the chirp mass depends on the total mass in this way. You can just do a little algebra to check that. So total mass is chirp mass times this function of this mass ratio. If the mass ratio were bigger than 1, in fact, then this m would be even bigger. So that's something you can really check. This is a minimum when q is 1. So if you assumed a different mass ratio, in fact, the objects need to be even more compact. So I'm even more likely to be a black hole in that case. And then similarly, eccentricity, well, that's easy. The r that we measure is the same major axis in Kepler's third law. If we had eccentricity, then the minimum approach distance would be r times 1 minus eccentricity. So the orbit is smaller at the closest point of approach. So the objects have to be even more compact than we discussed before. Okay. Again, as I emphasize again, these arguments cannot replace the full analysis, right? The actual analysis is much more complicated. I will talk about that in the next lectures. But at least as a first you know, thing that you might want to calculate, as an undergraduate or beginning student or so on, this is sort of, you see why these are two black hole systems. And again, you cannot do this for the other black hole detections. Why? Because they're not so loud. So if for the other events you were to do this analysis here, and you want to compute this particular plot, you would not see such a nice signal. In fact, if you do this for the binary, for, for the lighter black holes, you will just see noise, nothing more. And that is precisely when you have to do more complicated data anal analysis to extract the signal. But in this case, this was so loud that you could do even the simple analysis and at least understand what the system is. OK, so this this we completed. So now you can do more complicated analysis for 15.914. And then these are the results that were, that were found. These are the more accurate results. So what you found was that the initial masses were 36 and 29 solar masses with these error bars. And the spins were essentially consistent with non-spinning. So this chi is a dimensionless spin. So this is j upon m square for the black holes. So this is should be between. Uh, well, 0 and 1 or minus 1 and 1, depending how you, how you define it. But the, 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 in this case, from minus 1 to 1. And with these error bars, these are basically consistent with zero spin. So as far as we can tell, the model for non-spinning black holes with roughly comparable masses fits the data very well. So now, what you can also do is you can compute the mass of the final black hole. How do you do this? Well, uh, as I said, we have these numerical simulations of these binary black hole uh, mergers. So we can really compute uh, you know, the full merger process, look at what the final black hole is, and measure the final mass in these simulations. And then you can make a fit. You can say, well, based on these simulations, if these masses are initially this and the spins are, are this, what is the final mass and final spin? 
And then this is the answer. The final spin is roughly 0.67, and the final mass is about 61.8 solar masses. So now just an interesting uh, side remark here. So the first calculation for how much energy is lost in a binary black hole merger, that was by Stephen Hawking. Okay. So now going back here, you can say the initial mass is 36 plus 29, 65, right? Minus roughly 62. So roughly three solar masses are lost in gravitational waves. So now Stephen Hawking was the one who first asked, well, what is the largest energy that could be lost in a binary black hole merger? This is back in 1971. So in this case, you start with two black holes very far apart. Let's take masses M1 and M2. Now the final black hole remnant, let's say the mass is MF. And then you know that if you look at the event horizon of this full black hole merger, the area of the event horizon cannot decrease. It has to increase. So all of you have heard this somewhere, right? Uh, anyone who has not? Right? So now if a black hole has a mass m and a spin chi, the area is given by this expression here. So m1 times 1 plus the square root thing here. And, you have, and the result is the area increase law. You say A1 plus A2 must be, must be lesser than AF. So that gives you this constraint on what the masses and spins must be. And a little bit of uh, uh, for the manipulations, you want to limit what is called the efficiency, that is the mass that is rated away, divided by the total mass. So that is this quantity epsilon here. So that is, from this calculation, a limit of about 30% which is much too high, right? What we actually find is like three solar masses out of 60, that is much smaller than 30%. But in any case, uh, we cannot use this result to say that this we are confirming the area increase law because this is from a numerical fit. We are not measuring this final mass and final spin independently. I will explain briefly now how we, we might possibly do that. These are just examples of analysis that you can do with the data. Right? So this is not a full exhaustive list of all the tests you can do. This is an interesting one that I'm interested in, so I'll, I'll just talk about that. So the point is that we cannot test the area increase law and these kinds of things by these uh, analysis I talked about, because those, measure, those use GR to measure the final mass and spin. So those assume the area increase law, yes? Yes, indeed. So I will talk about these things tomorrow, um, indeed. So the way that these things work when you, when, when you go here is that you've got to assume some price for the initial parameters, so masses and the spins and so on, and you do the analysis and you get posterior distributions for these quantities, and these are sort of credible intervals based on those posteriors. Uh, this is dimensionless. So this is, uh, so chi is j upon m square. So j is the angular momentum of the black hole and m is the mass. And this should be between minus 1, depending on the uh, direction of j, so between minus 1 and 1. Yes. Uh, <laughs> That's all the, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And if it's a non-trivial thing, so if you compute this for the sun, you got a number bigger than one. Okay? So the fact that for black hole this is, has to be less than one is quite a non-trivial thing. Can you convert it to numbers that are familiar, like spin gradient per second? I could, yes. Uh, given I won't do it in real time here, but I can do it. Yes, I can. Uh, I can give you the. Numbers in those units, yes. Something which is not that I can write down the point for this when you're done. If you like, uh, there's a simple formula. If you know that chi, you can write down what would be the. You be careful with these things, but I can tell you what the spin period is of an observer who's sitting just outside the event horizon and seen by someone far away. That might be more useful. Yeah, Angular. Yeah, if you want that, also that that all of these can be this expressions for all of these things. 
but I'll have to do two minutes of some algebra yeah, to get you that yeah. number, yes. But uh, yeah, we always think in terms of the dimensionless quantities, uh, but yes. OK, so let me now give you, OK, I think we, can, we have still some time, right, for this? All right, so let me now give you a short um, description of how, we how you would measure these final parameters independently without doing analysis that I just told you. And once again, uh, Scott has very helpfully told you how, what the waveform looks like at the very late periods. So, so far, we always talked about the waveforms in the in-spiral part. So that's this part here. At the very end, the waveforms are more like the damp sinusoids that Scott talked about. Okay? So can we use that to measure the final mass and final spin? And indeed, we can. So let me tell you how. So what, this is the plot that was one of the LIGO publications, which was test of relativity with, with, the, with the first black hole detection. So let me go through this plot very slowly. Okay? So what you have are damp, the model is a damp sinusoid for the very end of the signal. Okay? So let me again draw that here briefly. So we have the data, which we have the in spiral, then the merger, and then it looks like a ring down, right? And before this is the in spiral, so I will not draw that. This is the peak of the waveform, let's say. This is the maximum amplitude that we saw. So now in this regime, you might hope that I can fit this data with a damp sinusoid. So I can just take a waveform, which looks like e to the minus t upon tau and cosine of some omega t plus a phase. And try to modify the parameters, the tau, the omega, and the phi, to fit this data. Then you've got to make a choice. From what point onwards do I start to assume that I can use this model? Can I start here? Can I start here? Can I start here? How far can I go? So keep the model in mind. When the black hole is, the common black hole is initially formed, it's highly distorted. And as it evolves, it loses the distortion and reaches a final curve black hole. And this damp sinusoid is valid only if you can represent the black hole as a perturbation of a curve black hole. So right when the black hole is formed, I do not expect that I can describe it well by a damp sinusoid. It should be a little bit later. Okay. Then let's do the analysis then, right? So this is the result. So if I start fitting the, the data one millisecond after the peak, and you want to get distributions of the decay time, that is this quantity tau, and the frequency in hertz, this is in, so 2 pi f in this case. So this tau and, and omega, that is what is plotted here. So you get this sort of a region in here, which is the most likely 90% credible interval. And you would get this green region here if you were to start one millisecond after the merger. If instead you start, let's say, three milliseconds after the merger, you get this purple one. If you start five milliseconds later, you get the red one. And seven milliseconds, you get the yellow one. And this one here is the prediction from GR based on the initial parameters. In other words, if these dotted lines agree with this solid line, then we have agreement with GR. And if not, then the things are not consistent. So of course, three, one millisecond after the merger, the data is not consistent with the fi final one because the black hole has not reached anything like a perturbed equilibrium solution. But, and three milliseconds after that, still not. But five milliseconds, yes. And of course, the later you go, the later you go here, you got less and less of the actual data that you can fit. So the error bars become larger. So that's why the later you go, 
the error regions become bigger and bigger. But even based on this, you can see that we have consistency with GR for five milliseconds after the merger. And if you then try to estimate, you know, from numerical simulations, at what time after the peak of the waveform can we assume the black hole has reached equilibrium, just numerical simulations, and that is consistent with this result. So we get consistency with a very fundamental prediction from GR, again, based on a very simple analysis. Of course, the accuracy is not great. I mean, we still have large error bars here. But with future observations of more sensitive data, we can hopefully beat this and get much better. So I will stop here, and we'll continue uh, in after the break. So questions? Sorry, which one do you mean? This one? Yeah. Oh, this is a neutron star binary. Oh. So there's a binary neutron star event, yeah. Yeah, so the final thing is a black hole, but the two initial objects are neutron stars. So that is very different from these other. That's why I listed separately here. This is a good question. So we haven't seen any direct evidence for the wave, gravitational wave after the merger. So this you've got to rely on numerical simulations. So this, sorry? I don't know. Huge <laughs> simulation. So yes, I mean, you get divergent results. Luciano will have some number for that. Others might have some other number. I don't know which one is right. And I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. In, in fairness. It depends how much mass is. In these events, a lot of matter is thrown off. That's kind of uncertain. So that has an impact on this. So. Okay. Yeah, again, so over the years, if the simulations keep on improving, then eventually you'll have a good answer. But even more with, with more de sensitive data, you might be able to measure the post-merger signal and thereby deduce a final mass independently. That is a belief, yes. In this case, that is a belief, yes. You know, that is almost, I mean, 136 plus 160. Well, 2.9 or something. Yeah, that's too heavy for a neutron star, so you would expect that to collapse then, so, yeah. Sorry, which one? Time variation of the signal. Is it possible to use yeah here? This one? Is it possible to use you know, in order to find the frequency of the time graph? Since you know the time variation of the signal, mm -hmm. is it possible to use wavelet transform to find this graph? In fact, yes. And in fact the un, these these analysis I mentioned, these burst searches, that's exactly what they do. So again, if you are if you're an expert on wavelets, use it, get the data, apply your wavelet technique, and publish.